Hi everyone, welcome to class. So today is another session of the AIMS daily and all of you must be aware by now that in this entire month at a fixed time slot of 7 p.m. All the educators in their respective time slots have come to you and given to you the most high yielding points and topics and MCQs for the May AIMS 2020. So today is yet another session in this AIMS daily and the topics that I'm going to concentrate on today are going to be related to number one, the lung tumors. So we are going to do a few images related to lung tumors. Then we are going to go on and discuss certain paraneoplastic syndromes associated with it. Following that, we are going to do a mixed bag of questions, probably a question or two from hematology. Then we might jump to blood banking. Then we'll come to some other small topics like one or two topics from genetics. In the end, like we always do, we will do one or two image related quiz where you will have to answer and give me the spotter image that I will show you. So without wasting any time and I welcome all the students who joined us. So let's begin with this high yielding session for the May AIMS 2020. So the first pattern of question that I'm going to discuss out here is going to be the true false pattern and I'm going to give you a particular um, question with an image and you need to label every statement related to this particular lesion as true or as false. So which of the following statement is true or false regarding this particular lung tumor? And that's the image shown to you. So first and foremost, you should be able to identify what exactly is being shown over here. So I'll give a moment to everyone for you to recall and recapitulate what was this appearance called as. Now, you know, it's a lung tumor. You know, this is some luminal structure out here. Luminal structure might ring a bell and you might think that it is a blood vessel. But the wall of this blood vessel has become very, very blue. What is this known as? I hope everyone can recall. This was the azopardi effect. This was the azopardi effect. So today I'm going to show you all the images related to lung tumors. This is the first one to start with. And I hope you can recall that this is small cell lung cancer. The previous terminology of small cell lung cancer was... Earlier, it was also known as the oat cell cancer, but now the newer terminology is the small cell lung cancer. So now you have understood and identified the image. Now come back to the question and look at every option given out here. Number one, is it positive for napsin A? And number two, is it positive for P63? Now these are different markers. Obviously, we'll make a table as to which marker comes positive in which particular lung tumor. But to start with, are these two markers of the small cell lung cancer? Are they markers of oat cell cancer? Both of these statements are false. I hope all of you can recall that napsin A, A for adenocarcinoma. Napsin A is a marker of lung adenocarcinoma, whereas P63, the way you write 60 with an S, P63 is going to be for squamous cell carcinoma. So remember, Napsin A is for adenocarcinoma, 63 is for squamous cell carcinoma. Next, commonly seen in smokers, and that's correct. Small cell carcinoma is commonly seen in smokers. This is a true statement. And last, most commonly metastasizes to the liver. So small cell cancer. I hope everyone can recall of all the lung tumors, this is said to be the most aggressive one. It is said to be the most aggressive one. And which part of the body does it very commonly metastasize to? It very commonly goes to the brain, not the liver. Liver would be lower down in the list. More commonly, it goes to the brain. So finally, your options are false, false, true, false. That's the answer. And all the students who got that right, great going. Now, having done that, let's go on to the other images that you can get in the exam. Okay, so this is what we were talking about over here. Remember, the tumor that we were talking about was the small cell or the oat cell cancer. So there are two important images that you have to know for the small cell or the oat cell cancer. This is number one. If you zoom into any one of these nuclei, I want everyone to probably strain your eyes a little bit and try and look at the nucleus of any of these cells. You will notice that it has certain dark areas and certain light areas. So there are some bluish dark areas and then there are whitish lighter areas in between. So what do you call that? That's known as the classical 
salt and pepper chromatin so salt refers to those whitish areas in between and pepper refers to the blackish areas so salt and pepper chromatin is what you see in small cell or oat cell cancer that's feature number one feature number two is what all of you saw in the image that i gave you for the question so over here you can see that this is a blood vessel it's a luminal structure it's a blood vessel and the wall of the blood vessel has become entirely blue it has become bluish why i want you to get back remember we did these cells called the salt and pepper chromatin cells these cells are very very fragile the cells of small cell or oat cell cancer are very very fragile so this means they are going to break when a cell breaks or when the nucleus breaks can i say the nucleus is always blue in color the chromatin is blue in color so all that bluish color is going to deposit on the wall of these blood vessels and this is what is giving it the bluish appearance so i hope everyone's clear small cell or oat cell lung cancer is going to show you the azopardi effect and what is the azopardi effect azopardi effect refers to the bluish discoloration of the vessel wall bluish discoloration of the vessel wall and why has it become blue i just told you because the tumor cells are fragile and they tend to break so that bluish chromatin tends to get deposited here this was number 1 that is small cell lung cancer please remember if they ask you the immunohistochemical markers it is positive for synaptophysin positive for synaptophysin and chromogranin it is positive for synaptophysin and chromogranin like i said for every tumor we are going to do its respective ihc also so it is positive for synaptophysin as well as chromogranin moving on moving on to the next tumor now i hope everyone can recall that whenever we see the presence of glands whenever we see the presence of glands we call it adenocarcinoma so in the lung if you're seeing the presence of atypical cells forming a gland a round structure like a gland you call it adenocarcinoma point number 1 point number 2 do you see this image over here where i have uh, given you the cells that have turned brown in color what is that stain that we use when the cells turn brown in color it is immunohistochemistry it is immunohistochemistry so please remember with immunohistochemistry and adenocarcinoma that's something i told you when we were solving the question also adenocarcinoma will be positive for napsin a as well as ttf1 now both of these are very important questions that you've got in the exam earlier ttf1 and napsin a are the immunohistochemical markers for adenocarcinoma so two tumors done let's go on to a variant of adenocarcinoma and that is a very classical one that you can probably expect in your exam now onwards so please remember there is a variant in which i want all of you to recall in which there is a classical appearance known as butterfly sitting on a fence as if if you notice the tumor cells appear as if they are all sitting on this one line on this one line they are all sitting over here so this is known as the classical butterfly on fence appearance what pattern is it it is the lepidic pattern it is the lepidic pattern it is said to be also growing basically along the alveoli so these are all the alveoli and do you notice that the tumor cells are basically growing along the alveoli so this is the lepidic pattern butterfly on fence appearance now before i proceed i want to ask all of you where else do you study lepidic anywhere else that you studied the word lepidic one i've told you that okay this can be a pattern that you can encounter in lung tumors another place please remember i would appreciate if anyone could answer this lepidic cells are seen where let me give you a hint maybe they are seen in a heart tumor maybe they are seen in a heart tumor maybe they are seen in the most common heart tumor that you have in adults i've given you a great hint out here the most common heart tumor that you see in adults is going to show you the lepidic cells and yes it is myxoma yes it is myxoma so remember lepidic word should remind you of two things number one a cardiac tumor that is myxoma which will show you the lepidic cells and number two the presence of this pattern in the lung tumors moving on to the next one i think this is a classical picture no matter which organ you see it in 
very nicely you can see this tumor island and something pinkish that is present in between now what is this pinkish if you're thinking in terms of lung tumors three images should always come to your mind small cell adeno and squamous so small cell i hope everyone remembers you were seeing the salt and pepper chromatin you were seeing the azopardi effect in adeno the word adeno will always remind you of glands so what are you left with you're left with squamous cell carcinoma and how do i identify a squamous cell carcinoma by the presence of these pinkish keratin pearls the pinkish keratin pearls are indicative of squamous cell carcinoma very important finding you see a similar tumor in the esophagus squamous cell carcinoma of the esophagus you see a similar morphology in the skin it becomes squamous cell carcinoma of the skin so just the organ will keep on changing but the squamous cell carcinoma morphology remains the same so now the question will come that we were doing markers for every tumor so the immunohistochemical marker i told you right in the beginning when we were doing the questions p63 p63 is the immunohistochemical markers so quick revision for small cell carcinoma it was synaptophysin and chromogranin for adenocarcinoma it was ttf1 and napsin a for squamous cell carcinoma it is p63 Three. So these three tumors and these markers are important from your even match the following point of view. They might give you the name of a tumor, they might give you the name of the markers, and you have to match them. So that's another important way in which the AIMS exam can possibly test you on lung tumors. So I hope everyone's clear with the question that we've done today. The pattern as well as the azopardi effect, the immunohistochemical markers. So I hope that question is clear. I hope all these images are also clear. because on the same pattern now we are going to begin with the paraneoplastic syndromes now you are well aware of the terminology now you just need to match the paraneoplastic syndromes with their respective tumors now for all out of that entire table in neoplasia let me tell you that paraneoplastic syndromes of the lung are the most important most important because which is the most common tumor associated with paraneoplastic syndromes it is lung cancer so all variants of lung cancer will be associated with different types of paraneoplastic syndromes let's begin first let's see how much of it can you recall hypercalcemia i hope everyone remembers your basics from neoplasia that hypercalcemia is the most common paraneoplastic syndrome overall not just lung cancer overall hypercalcemia is the most common paraneoplastic syndrome but amongst the lung cancers which one do you see it in hypercalcemia yes is seen in squamous cell carcinoma it is seen in squamous cell carcinoma number 2 migratory thrombophlebitis so right in the end we'll make a table also first let's finish attempting this question number 2 migratory thrombophlebitis first and foremost from your knowledge of surgery you need to tell me what is the other name of migratory thrombophlebitis and i will tell you that this is seen in adenocarcinoma so what is the other name of migratory thrombophlebitis is given a fancy name it is trosseus phenomena yes it is trosseus phenomena please keep that in mind not the trosseus sign trosseus sign is something that you will see in case of hypocalcemia that's a separate sign the trosseus sign right that's separate this is the trosseus phenomena migratory thrombophlebitis if i break the term itis means inflammation phlebitis means inflammation of the veins thrombo means thrombus formation so there is inflammation and thrombus formation in the veins and this is shifting from one vein to another to a third to a fourth it's a migratory phenomena so migratory thrombophlebitis is seen with adenocarcinoma number 3 SIADH syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion is seen with oat cell cancer i hope you remember that's the old term the new term is small cell lung cancer and lastly enlargement of the breast size is seen in enlargement of the tumor cells that's how you remember it so gynecomastia is seen in large cell carcinoma 
So hypercalcemia is seen in squamous cell carcinoma. Migratory thrombophlebitis is seen in adenocarcinoma. SIADH is seen in small cell carcinoma and gynecomastia is seen in large cell carcinoma. So if you have to finally make your summary table of the paraneoplastic syndromes for the lung cancers, this is what we've done. Squamous cell, hypercalcemia. I hope you remember hypercalcemia is the most common paraneoplastic syndrome. Most common paraneoplastic syndrome. Number two, adenocarcinoma. Now please remember adenocarcinoma of the lungs because you're studying it over here as well as adenocarcinoma of the pancreas both of them will show this trosuse phenomena or the migratory thrombophlebitis coming to third small cell you will see that it's small cell which is associated with maximum number of paraneoplastic syndromes what all are they SIADH that was the question given to you syndrome of inappropriate ADH secretion Number two, Cushing's disease. And number three, the Lambert-Eaton syndrome. So maximum number of PNS you have with small cell. And like I told you for large cell, the size of the cell becomes large, the size of the breast becomes large. So large cell carcinoma is associated with gynecomastia. So these were your tables of paraneoplastic syndrome. So roughly you've done the important points related to lung cancers, their images, as well as their paraneoplastic syndrome. Now let's shift our focus. Let's move from lung tumors and let's go on to a little bit of a hematology. So let's first read this question together. There is a biopsy that has been done from an orbital mass in a six year old child. So orbital mass, the child presented with bilateral proptosis. So up till here, the information that you have is there is a child who has an orbital mass and obviously he has bilateral proptosis, but the biopsy was done from that mass and it shows atypical cells so you started thinking somewhere in terms of a cancerous lesion because they're saying atypical cells what is the genetic study showing you it is showing you translocation 821 translocation 821 and the same specimen is going to show positivity for mpo that's pretty much a catch point out here myeloperoxidase so you have an orbital mass you have a six-year-old child that mass is showing atypical cells those cells are positive for which stain? For MPO. And which genetic alteration? 821. I think they've given the answer away to you that this is something similar to AML, acute myeloid leukemia. Leukemia means blood cancer. However, this is not in the blood. They've told you that the atypical cells are present in the orbit. So what do you call when AML occurs in the soft tissue? What would your answer be? The AML, the leukemia, instead of happening in the blood, has happened in a soft tissue. Yes, this is a case of myeloid sarcoma, also known as multiple other names that I'll discuss in the next slide. But your answer for this question is a myeloid sarcoma. Now let me just quickly go through the other ones. Choristoma, they just gave you because myeloid sarcoma is also given another name called chloroma it's also known as chloroma so because chloroma and choristoma are so similar sounding and they've given it to you as the first option that you know the student might know the answer might read this and in in that stress in that tension end up marking this so you need to be very clear myeloid sarcoma is known as a chloroma that's separate what is a choristoma choristoma basically means ectopic tissue it means ectopic tissue for example this is a stomach and in the wall of the stomach, you're seeing the presence of pancreatic tissue. So that's an ectopic tissue. That has nothing to do with the tumor. It's not going to show any atypical cells. It's not going to show any genetic problem. It's not going to show myeloperoxidase positivity. It's just some ectopic tissue present. That's the end of the story. That's it. Coming to the next. So this option is certainly ruled out. Coming to next. Langerhand cell histiocytosis. Because that can also present as an orbital mass. Langerhans cell histiocytosis but will it show the translocation 821 will it show myeloperoxidase positivity no i hope you remember it shows the classical cd1a positivity and i also hope everyone remembers the classical tennis racket appearance that you see on electron microscopy in fact for Langerhans cell histiocytosis, the classical diagnosis that you do is with the help of electron microscopy only. That's the gold standard for the diagnosis. And if someone asks you the CD marker, it is CD1A. 
Number three, I'll talk about. Number four is CML. See, CML is so different because you know it is showing translocation 922. I need not even ask anyone because this is the classical Philadelphia chromosome. So CML certainly was the most absurd option out here. There was obviously no confusion, and that's how the questions come in the exam. You will notice that most of the single answer questions, two options will be totally distinct, and you'll you know at just one glance you will be able to eliminate those. The confusion, unfortunately, always remains in the last two options, the remaining two options. And while doing your practice, like in these practice sessions, as well as when you're practicing on your own, you basically have to train your eyes and your brain to be able to differentiate between those two remaining options, which are the closest differentials. That should be your aim because two options will easily be ruled out. Out of four, two will easily be ruled out. It's the remaining two which give you a trouble. and that's what you're training yourself for the way that you can do it is you have to try and focus on every option now when you're solving mcqs you just don't have to look at the question look at the answer and straight away jump to the conclusion and the discussion no you have to know why the other options were ruled out first of all why the other options were included because if the examiner has included these options he's trying to confuse you at some level of the other so you should be able to rule out on your own that okay it's not a choristoma the examiner wanted to confuse me with the chloroma but i'm very sure that choristoma is an ectopic tissue chloroma is the other name for a myeloid sarcoma so that is what i want to tell you myeloid sarcoma is also known as chloroma it is also known as a granulocytic sarcoma so now do you notice i told you it's an aml it's an aml of the soft tissue aml is a leukemia it's a blood cancer but here i'm again and again calling it a sarcoma because this has happened in the tissues what is it also known as it is also known as chloroma in fact it is also known as a myeloblastoma it is also known as a myeloblastoma so it is aml of the soft tissue myeloid sarcoma granulocytic sarcoma chloroma myeloblastoma all of them mean the same it is aml of the soft tissue and what's the most common site the most common site is the orbit that was what was given to you in the question So now, if the most common site is the orbit, what would be the most common presentation? Again, what was given to you in the question? That is proptosis. So orbit is the most common site. Proptosis is the most common manifestation. Which is the most common type of AML that you encounter in these chloromas? Remember when we did hematology, we've discussed that AML can be from M zero to M seven. So you have M zero, one, two, three, four, up till seven. out of them the most common which you see associated with chloromas is m2 that is why i hope everyone remembers m2 is the one that is associated with translocation 821 that was given to you in the question if you notice the question was it shows the presence of translocation 821 right so please remember it is aml m2 which is associated with translocation 821 now comes i would say the extra edge question which you would expect in papers like central institute exams like aims what cells do you see now that's a fancy name that's why they put it up to you arbiskov cells are what you see in a myeloblastoma or in a myeloid sarcoma whatever you want to call it these are what cells first of all you need to know a one liner arbiskov cells are seen in this tumor number 2 what exactly are these cells they are actually please remember they are actually the monocytes now most students think that okay this is an aml and aml will have myeloblast so maybe this is a fancier name for a myeloblast no arbiskov cells are actually monocytes that you see in this particular tumor they have been given this name for the stains i'm sure everyone knows from the question i told you it was positive for myelo peroxidase so that was the question that you had to know regarding myeloid sarcoma please remember it's a very very important topic every bullet point that i've told you out here is a potential question in itself okay moving on let's go to like i said we will do a particular technique for genetics so it's a simple one it's also something that has been asked in the aims exam earlier so i thought of discussing it out here it's a single best answer question which of the following is considered as the best technique for isolating and studying the tumor cells when you have a contaminated background let me give you an example the clinician has sent you a prostate biopsy or the clinician has sent you a breast biopsy correct a core breast biopsy unfortunately in that biopsy the number of the tumor cells were very few 
whereas the contaminants were a lot like you had surrounding fibro fatty tissue you had surrounding adipose tissue you had a lot of surround blood hemorrhage but the tumor cell concentration was very less so can i say that there were a lot of tumor there was tumor cells against a lot of contamination in the background but now the clinician has sent the biopsy to you and he's put it in your coat that you have to tell me what is the genetic problem that these breast tumor cells are carrying so you can't just say that okay the tumor cell population is very less and i did not make an effort you have to make an effort with whatever material you've got and in such a troublesome scenario the methodology that we apply is pyro sequencing so if you just notice if you just notice the other options look at these three options to be more precise we are talking about sanger sequencing pyro sequencing and single base primer extension let's talk about each one out of all of these out of all of these sanger is the one that has the g these are all types of pcr and out of all of these sanger is the one that has the g so if someone asks you which is the gold standard pcr so g for gold standard and sanger is the only one with the g so sanger sequencing is the gold standard pcr point number 1 Point number two, pyro sequencing, which we just did right now. You are going to see tumor cells against a contaminated background. You are going to see tumor cells against a contaminated background. Okay, moving on. Single base primer extension. Single base. Now focus on the term. You know the locus out here. Single base means you know where exactly the problem is and where you have to test for it. for example that when you are dealing with braf mutation when you are dealing with braf so you call it the braf v600e mutation i'm sure all of you have read it in couple of tumors let's take the example of papillary carcinoma thyroid so if i say it shows braf if the clinician has you know diagnosed papillary carcinoma thyroid by fnsc and maybe by a resection surgery papillary carcinoma thyroid diagnosis has been made the clinician wants you to tell him is it carrying the braf mutation so now you know that it's papillary carcinoma thyroid in that the mutation is braf v600e mutation so you test at the 600 codon you know exactly where to test so can i say in single base primer extension you will use the, this technique when you have a known genetic locus when you have a known genetic locus this is very very important so single base primer extension is a technique where you have known genetic locus pyro sequencing comes for the contaminated background sanger has the g so that is the gold standard pcr coming back you had a fourth option called blotting i hope everyone remembers northern blotting southern blotting western blotting and there should be no confusion in this you do this in microbio path medicine biochemistry so many subjects you do blotting in north south west don't get confused northern blotting is for detection of rna southern blotting is for detection of dna and western blotting is for the detection of protein I have not put this across as a question to all of you because I assume that all of you are already aware of it. I am hundred percent sure that you are. But a simple mnemonic, just in case you couldn't recall, I am sure you've heard of this before. In north, there is consumption of roti, so RNA is in northern blotting. In south, there is consumption of dosa, so in southern blotting there is DNA detection. In west, there is consumption of pizzas, so you have protein in. that is being detected in western blotting so that's how you remember north south and west i hope these techniques are clear but out of these if i say the one that is asked repeatedly is pyro sequencing that is when you have a contaminated background so that was the question that you had when it came to the genetic techniques okay so now before i end today's session i want to put up like i always do i want to put up this classical image quiz that you must know that you must know and maybe we've done this once earlier but i want you to embed it in your visual memory we've done this on the an academy plus platform also where we keep having a lot of image based sessions regularly so this is a renal tumor if you want more hints it's a uh, it's seen in a 3 year old child and i think i've given away the answer with saying that that if you have a renal tumor in a pediatric patient you are talking about what is the tumor that should come to your mind it is the wilms tumor i hope everyone remembers the other name for wilms tumor 
Wilms tumor is also known as the triphasic tumor. Wilms tumor is also known as the triphasic tumor. Correct. So what are the three phases? I've tried to encircle them. The three phases that you have are epithelial, mesenchymal and blastimal. So let me go one by one. Epithelial, look at this one. It is trying to form a roundish structure. It is probably trying to form a tubule, maybe trying to form a glomerulus. It is an epithelial structure. Whenever I use the word M for mesenchymal, whenever I use the word mesenchymal, I will always mean these elongated, spindly kind of cells, the mesenchymal tissue. And whenever I use the word blastimal, for blastimal, remember it is B for blastimal and B for blue. So all this slide, do you appreciate that this slide has this excessive blue tinge to it? Because all these bluish cells that you have are the blastimal cells. So remember, epithelial would form these tubules and glomeruli. Mesenchymal will give you spindly cells. And blastimal is going to give you the bluish cells that are giving this entire tumor a bluish appearance. I hope this is clear.